roll on. So I wanted to thank everybody for coming um, and just give you a little bit of an overview of the, um, the, the format for tonight. So we've got nine speakers um, and they're going to speak to about 15 slides for about 20 seconds, so it's meant to be very short and sharp and fun. Um, and we've got the Deputy Lord Mayor, Helen, who's going to introduce the evening, and Jaime. Um, and uh, just in terms of housekeeping, just want to say there's bathrooms here and here, up through there and over here. Um, and... Uh, so, another thing which is really important is this event's being recorded, just so everybody's aware of that. Um, and another thing I just really wanted to say is that I've invited everybody here to speak, you know, for themselves, but what is said this evening doesn't necessarily, doesn't reflect the views of the City of Hobart, so that's a really important thing for everybody to understand. So you're being recorded and you're, you know, you're speaking for yourself. Fantastic. All right, so I'm going to invite Helen up. That'll be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Oh, <laughs> can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. It's it's great to see you here. Uh, I see my colleague Bill Harvey, Councillor Bill Harvey. Uh, thank you for coming along, Bill. <laughs> Um, it's good to know that uh, elected members are interested uh, in the topic of urban design guidelines. I heard there was free food. Oh, and that there's free food. When the, when the music starts, it might be a matter of interpretive dance, so just be ready. I want to start by acknowledging the Muanina people, who were the original custodians of this place we call Hobart, Nipaluna and pay respects to the Palawa people of Tasmania, La Truita. Their stories have, and their, their place here um, is undeniable and comes through with the work and planning that we do. And so too, the various layers of people and that history that, that is layered through this place. So not only the landscape, uh, but also uh, where the landscape and the geography is just so important to this place uh, and it's pretty special as a, a, a backdrop which we call home. This city was built on country and that is a very complex idea. So we have country and then a city and all of this is now part of this unique landscape that we, we call Hobart and the Luna. And with this, there is change over the many years uh, of uh, people's existence in this place. But we also have the other challenges. We have challenges and, and a question we must ask ourselves is how this place evolves and we evolve with it. And how do we prepare for change? The city is always changing. And um, as Palawa man Duane Everett Smith said uh, about climate change, you have to change your tools to, to meet that as well. So this, that brings us to this evening's gathering. The future, future urban design guidelines are part of our journey as a city and as a community to recognise and express how we can influence Hobart's evolution as our island's capital city. A city where where the places we live, work, play and visit are welcoming, playful, vibrant, green, accessible, inclusive and safe. What does this all mean in terms of how we foster better urban design outcomes in our city? When approximately 50% of our municipality's carbon emissions come from transport, we need to consider how having better streets that are wider, shaded in summer, greener, with ample seating, good lighting, and our destinations uh, themselves that make us want to either walk or scoot or bike there. In turn, this can improve access, provide more opportunities for exercise, and even more opportunities to incorporate indigenous planting. Ultimately, it is about functional and well-designed public spaces 
and development. The urban design guidelines will be the first design policy for our city and will be innovative in the sense that they offer a common and positive language for how we want our city's built environment to change. The draft urban design principles at their heart are built on the extensive community consultation process of the endorsed community vision from 2018, translating it to urban design approaches for both the public and the private realm. So this evening is full of alliteration for one uh, and it's also intended to be fun and informal uh, to, to help spark conversation. So we've got a lot of amazing, intelligent people in this room. Uh, so I hope that the discussion tonight is really fruitful and that you all can participate but also get so much out of it. Thank you very much. Helen, um, I'd now like to invite Mike, um, who's my boss, to come up and introduce the project. Thank you. Hello everyone. So we better race through this because there seems to be a mini lull. Okay, so um, the structure for the night is obviously we've had the beautiful introduction and welcome by the Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, Helen Burnett. Uh, now, very briefly going to talk about the initial um, development of the urban design principles that will lead to the urban design guidelines um, over the next year or so. And then we have the real important parts of the night, which are the very short um, fire presentations, a little bit picture kutcher style, um, slightly adapted, and then we'll have really the, the most important part of the night, which is um, your opportunity to um, express how you feel about uh, the city as a place and how we can make better um, urban design um, and value the uniqueness that we have here in Hobart. And obviously this is as well an opportunity um, for all of you uh, to have some food as well, so we don't want any leftovers. Um, and hopefully we'll be finishing just a bit after eight. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the just see if I can take this now. So um, in terms of the structure of why do we need urban design guidelines? Well, we need urban design guidelines for the same reasons as we need many other strategies, policies, and uh, actions and projects, which is we need to recognise that also our built form and our open spaces need to adapt to, our change, uh, to climate change. They also need to promote health. Uh, currently, we're a very unhealthy uh, nation and um, type 2 diabetes, for example, is a real um, you know, um, epidemic. Then it's also about starting to recognise that intrinsically where we live is country and what does that mean in our cities and we need to start that uh, dialogue and this is just the beginning. Uh, it's also about the reality of accommodating um, growth and change in a way that still re represents and respects our our character and what we love and share about Hobart and as well it's about the right to the city access um, regardless of your background your age um, regardless of what uh, culture you come from and regardless of your you know level of uh, mobility um, you have a right to the city so if we go back one please yep and the what is quite simply about influencing the private um, development and uh, public realm through initially uh, policy settings and that later might evolve into uh, clearer um, controls as time goes by. Um, and really the mechanisms to do this are things like uh, looking into uh, street trees, and what does that mean in terms of the urban canopy when you apply that uh, to all of our great um, uh, 
uh, neighbourhoods, other things like um, uh, listening to the outcomes from the climate strategy that is being developed now that um, will probably also point to the fact that uh, transport uh, is our biggest emitter in Hobart, about 70% of all our emissions come from that source. So what does that mean in terms of facilitating a city that's better for walking and cycling? So uh, in terms of the application, next slide, please. Um, initially, you know, the scope is the whole of uh, the local government area, the whole of the city of Hobart, but we're probably more focusing now on the city centre, the neighbourhood centres, and uh, parts of the neighbourhoods um, that link them. And some, but some of the considerations may also extend to uh, great uh, nature reserves. And uh, um, we'll probably not reach Mount Kunyani, but we'll need to explore that um, through the development over the next year or so. Next, so we did some background research, and a lot of it wasn't surprising, but. We looked at equivalent documents in other jurisdictions across Australia and the thematics of those. Public realm was number one. Um, the perception of safety and how can we make our cities safe was the second most um, used term and the second most um, form uh, concentration of guidance that was contained in those documents. The third one is how we make our cities accessible in terms of their um, built form. Climate resilience has risen a lot in the last few years and it's uh, heartening to see this because it's starting to really um, broaden its importance through everything we do um, at local governments, state governments um, and across the country. Um, I won't go through the rest, but it's interesting to, to note as well that um, indigenous uh, culture uh, wasn't there a few years ago and now is already um, starting to emerge as a very big theme. Uh, next. So, suffice to say that we've had a number of very good conversations and workshops uh, internally to understand what our fellow colleagues at City of Hobart are doing uh, that might relate to uh, the built environment and how we can help them deliver as well their great work, their strategies, their policies, their projects, um, partly through the um, policy that we'll be developing. Then we en engaged with um, obviously our Brains Trust, which is uh, the Urban Design Advisory Panel, and then we've had um, key stakeholder, initial key stakeholder conversations, just to see what is the um, the appetite and what is the general scope of how we should proceed with developing the urban design guidelines over the next year or so. We had conversations with our colleagues in the state government, um, for example, you know, Homes Tasmania, Department of State Growth, etc. And right now. Uh, all of that's been synthesised. This evening is a first opportunity to have a public conversation about it. So also, as the night progresses, if there's any thoughts of ideas under these principles, any strategies, any approaches that you want to capture, um, feel free to go over there to the ping pong table and write them down. Um, and there's also a sheet there for people to write down their contact details if they want to you know, be kept in the loop and be part of the, the future conversation and engagement on this. And what we're going to do is um, develop you know, uh, draft guidelines, go out, have those conversations I mentioned, and hopefully get them um, adopted as a council policy later in the year. And next. So what does all this mean? What is a policy? So this is a simple, beautiful way of explaining it. Um, that uh, uh, Megan did as a, as a graph, but it also reflects um, the, the thinking of Andy Fergus as well, and a few others um, in the urban design space. So the idea of the compliance floor is simply, you know, all of the statutory things that council has to do um, when it uh, develops or, it, you know, the city or when private development happens. Most normally, that is the planning scheme that you 
you know, all probably have, have had to interact with, but there's many other um, regulations around that. And then there's the things that push the envelope, you know, those conversations like the ones we have tonight um, and those ideas that are not captured currently in the, in the regulations. So the part of that is captured as well through the design review process and we're very lucky in Hobart to have the Urban Design Advisory Panel and the, this policy will start to form a, a framework to push that innovation and then certain elements of that will then go back to the planning scheme and advance in the, um, our statutory um, agenda as well in years to come. So, final. So, these are the nine uh, principles, urban design draft principles that have emerged through the conversations and from the research. They try to be quite broad um, so they're open to incorporate many ideas, but also, you know, thanks to the uh, sensibility, I think, of, uh, of Megan, they're also very much about um, the place, very much about Hobart. So, uh, country, you know, we do definitely um, sit in, uh, in a very privileged um, place in, in Australia. And we have to then, you know, um, feel our relationship with the landscape. And there's a presenter that later that will go into that. Um, coherent, you know, some of the um, greatest cities also have um, that capacity to have elements that make them understood, and that we can also, in a very um, materialistic way, maintain and provide for the community. Um, culture, what are the opportunities for uh, you know, um, urban spaces, future developments to also um, provide for um, creative, uh, the creative economy and how can we also reuse and adapt the enormous amount of um, uh, you know, built form um, and existing public realm that we have. Um, capital, obviously we have a very important role here in Hobart to um, partly um, provide for those uh, stately functions, but also it's about the economics of um, the bigger companies that would set in Hobart and probably won't set in other parts of, um, of Tasmania. Um, all of this needs to happen together and all of it needs to be connected and only through uh, very uh, good um, opportunities to walk, cycle, use public transport, we can um, uh, adapt and we can also uh, do it in a way that is economically resilient. Um, so there's also the capacity to um, uh, create spaces maybe of incubation, um, spaces that you know, lead to new things that we haven't predicted. We need to leave that door open. It's very important as well that our cities are caring in the sense that they need to be for um, kids from eight, you know, all the way to people to 80, as it's said, um, by Enrique Peñalosa, a very famous um, uh, ex-mayor uh, of Bogota, who changed the city by being caring. Um, but it's also about recognizing that we've got new communities, multicultural communities like um, that are coming and in, and being open to new ideas and new people. Um, circular, well, how do our water systems, how, do, how does our very um, energy generation and all of the um, enormous amount of materials that we need for the city, how can those be reused and how can we rethink that? And then finally, ultimately, um, the intensity um, and the creativity of our cities comes from um, the fact that we're together and we can exchange ideas and only compact cities um, tend to, to thrive over time and in many ways they are the um, engine room of uh, human civilization for millennia. So without further ado, um, we'll go into the really fun part of the, of the evening. So thank you very much. Right, so 
to continue with this fabulously awkward presentation I've been making. Um, Teresa, who is our first speaker, actually can't be here tonight, um, but it's really beautiful that she can't be here because she's at the 50th anniversary of the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre and she has made a message for us that I'm going to play, which is incredibly beautiful. And, you know, I just respect that completely. So we'll start. There's no other way to begin than with her message. Let's press go. Mina Mila Dina Wurungihi Mita Pula Napaya Moini Utrumitina Umuli Paula Nungampi Nini Pama Tapra Kuntanata Mina Kunani Takamuna Yuta Nipuluna Paula Wangayaki Makumini Paula Nini Makara Nui Mila Dina Di Mui Nina, Uki Arumi. Mina Mui Nina, Paolo Wangini, Paolo Nawina, Tintu Mili Mina Nita. Umili Raichi, Mila Dina, Tai Mini Nina Raichi Ta. Mila Dina Mui Nina. Takari Hia Mana Mapli Ngai Api Rumi. Milankana, Milaitina Mana Mapali, Kukraka Baka Rumi Pai Wuta. Warranta Kanapila Patrula Ta, Warranta Kutia Takara Milaitina Mana Mapali, Tunabri Palawangini Makara Manina Pai Wuta Manta, Pai Uti Mui Nina Makara Milaitina Nara Pai Wuta Manta. Warren to pack an obara. To carry the amount of money, Makara looked to me to tea, pie water, Nayapi Palwa. Pack an anini palma, Takara Miladina ta. Wine a puni patrol, man of money, being in a nairy, to carry the amount of money, Miladina, man of money. Warren to Tunapri Tunapri, Muinina. Warranted to not be to not be packing a nini. To bury here, nini, do to eat a tea. Warranted to not be to not be canapilla and give you no happy. Warranted packing a wire. So I just wanted to also say that we've actually commissioned some cultural advice from Teresa and her, sorry, her colleague Zoe. Um, so we've been obviously very patient while that's been prepared. So we will, the first principle that we're talking about tonight is country and being that complex idea of a city or country. So we're really looking forward to hearing what that might become. So thank you. Next speaker. land with a load of stuff in it. Um, that's, you know, buildings, roads, trees, flowers, footballs, telephones, people playing music. It's just full of stuff. But it's kind of a, an agreed thing that 
this stuff needs to be organized into some kind of coherent manner. Um, <laughs> so I guess really the, um, the, the interesting thing is, is, is co being coherent as a city is more than just this kind of coherent level of infrastructure. It's something much more complicated. So, I'm going to have to change like two things at the same time here. So, I guess what it really is, it's a, it's a delicate balance uh, where diverse systems coexist harmoniously. Uh, this is a fun little diagram I quite like to use when I start with all projects and pick out the ones that are really in play at a certain time and how do we find those, those overlapping pieces to really create cyclical systems and value. But um, I think in this context, the, the key lies in connecting these systems coherently in a way uh, that contributes to the well-being of the whole, um, making the whole greater than the sum of its parts. Um, next one. Oh, no, I've got to press two buttons. That's right. So, I, but the other thing to uh, understand is these systems work on lots of different levels. So the, um, the, the idea of subsystems within them, so I'll use transport as an example, you know, transport, big system, but within there there's, uh, there's, there's the kind of vehicular movement, there's pedestrian movement, there's car, um, bus movement, all of these kind of subsystems happening. Um, but then also on a kind of more micro level, there's uh, levels of kind of, you know, the curbstones, the, the crossings, the lighting, all facilitating this bigger system that we're seeing within the city. Um, so I guess the question is, how can we understand such complexity and, uh, and how can we predict the future of these systems and how can we adapt the city and design with these and manage these and plan for the future? So, um, so really, that falls to the role of many of us in this room, I'm sure, as multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, urbanists to link these systems together to bring about uh, the multiple co-benefits they offer uh, to enhance the overall resilience, efficiency, and sustainability of these, um, and whilst making them more accessible and easier to understand for their users. And I think that's where the coherence bit comes into it. I think it's, we can make these things very complex, which I guess I am right now by talking about them, but making them intuitive and easy for users to understand is crucial, crucial. So, um, so linking large, uh, these large variety of connecting systems together um, uh, unifies holes in the basic condition of urban coherence in the context of complexity. That's very complex, but this example is incredible. So this is Copenhagen, um, and a great symbol for this, which is, this is Copenhagen's waste disposal unit. Um, where they have a forest growing on top of it and a ski field running down the, the back of it as well. So that just shows how they've linked all these different things together, which has made this um, something that's just so much more than what it was before. And it's also made it that users that come to maybe use a ski, ski field now understand the waste disposal unit that's working within their city. Um, it's an incredible piece. I've given you the most, most boring shot of it, but that's because I love the nature on top. Um, so. So, <laughs> challenges. Um, so, uh, but this is not, it's not easy to do. To bring these overlaps together is not very difficult. To, it is very difficult to do. Uh, we have diverse stakeholders, fragmented governments, legacy infrastructure, financial constraints, resistance to change, technological gaps, uh, and varied public perceptions. So, I think it's how do we navigate these cha challenges? Um, oh, really? Is that one minute? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, it requires, um, I guess, really good strategic planning, which is, you know, one of the things that the City of Hobart's undertaking at the moment. Collaboration, which this is a part of, but also commitment, and commitment over a long time. Um, okay. So, I think, where do we start? Um, in many cities, the layout and the street patterns are already established, Hobart being one of them. Um, they're shaped historic, uh, by historic events, cultural um, events, geographical and economic factors over time. Um, so Barcelona, for example, here is a clear structure, very clear structure, based on um, order, law, and reason. Um, so a lot of this is inherited and stuff that we can't really change. But um, the morphology influences various aspects of the city, um, and those transports, those systems that I was talking about earlier. And so then those systems, as they adapt, how do we make them 
sit in between all of this structure that we find. Um, oh. Is that time? <laughs> Jesus Christ, five minutes goes for that. But anyway, so um, I'm just going to keep going because I think it's important. Um, so, <laughs> the, um, so really, our job becomes about tweaking around the edges. Right, I'm going to speed up there. Um, so cities find it difficult to, uh, to find coherent patterns uh, of development. Um, why individual buildings may be attractive or exciting in themselves, uh, the cumulative effect can sometimes be disappointing with the strong organising patterns often missing. This is Docklands' terrible, terrible mistake of Melbourne. Um, so, and potentially could be it. Um, so then the metrics of coherence is the context, in this context, are defined by visual order. Uh, through consistency and complementary scale, character and arrangement of buildings. Um, these are uh, very difficult to enforce, cities struggle to make, make this happen, architects fight hard to try and make this happen, but it comes down to enlightened developers, which we don't have many of, unfortunately. Um, so then, um, this puts a lot of emphasis on the public realm. Uh, and this is interesting that Jaime was saying that, that was the top of one of the, the things that they were talking about um, in these kind of strategies. Um, so good public realm has the ability to forgive chaotic architecture, uh, can be easily retro retrofitted into existing urban structure, and in an increasingly complex world, bring together diverse systems for the benefit of all. So, um, uh, so cities, much, um, cities must also now focus on brand. I think that's a new thing that we're starting to do, is cities have to compete globally. Brand becomes really important to attract tourists, investors and inhabitants. Um, so if a, fa a city fails to secure a coherent image, or create a myth about itself at least, um, it's doomed to depression and being no more attractive even to its own citizens. Um, this slide, this, so this is, uh, we've been working with the, the City of Hobart on some of their public realm. Um, this is 37 sites that we assessed across the City of Hobart, and we found 152 unique types of paving, 73 unique benches, and 45 unique bollards just across 37 sites. So that, that's a real indicator of uh, a problem that we're finding here. Um, it's, uh, so I guess that's really a result of limited design standards um, and uh, leading to inconsistency in the language and, and it's starting to kind of erode the unique character of Hobart that we know and love um, and often uh, leads to very complex asset management um, pr processes. Okay, I'm getting very close, it's 15 slides. Um, so the design of successful public realm relies on human psychology, psychological responses. Um, space is only experienced positively when it is coherent and provides intuitive legibility, use, image and comfort. Um, it's Brisbane, James Street. Control freak, men, craziness on that street, but it's incredible to walk down. Um, so um, I'll wrap up with this, which is public realm coherency is a large scale issue for cities. Um, but through strict rules and long term persistence, a canvas for complexity, um, expression, and spontaneity can be created. Um, that will, I'll finish there. Sorry, I went way over time. <laughs> Um, and um, I should also say that was Alaric, who is a landscape architect, who is one of the best architects. Um, and I yeah, didn't give you an intro, but so Alaric is from Realm Studio and their project up in Launceston at Inveress. Just what, what award did you win? Can you tell us again? I got a Tassie and National Yeah, yeah, so beautiful things to say and also beautiful work in the public domain. So we look forward to seeing more of that in Tasmania. Thank you. All right, so next week. Um, okay. So our next speaker tonight is Matt, and Matt is principal from Taylor and Hines with Poppy also. Um, and I've invited Matt here tonight to speak because he knows just um, how long you need to think about an old house before you even touch it. So um, I have a little quote that I thought of for everybody, and the one I wanted to say for Matt was that um, demolishing a house is probably one of the most wasteful things that humans do. So that's why it's so important to consider it really carefully. So, thank you, Matt. So, these are entirely my deep-seated views. Um, <laughs> as an architect, I think about culture a lot. 
culture is most commonly defined as a way of life. I think this is what makes the act of design a cultural act. The Borough Charter goes further and describes cultural heritage as embodied in places themselves. Note, it didn't say that they are seen in the places, it says that it is embodied. That is, culture is felt and experienced. So if we become less concerned about how things look and more about how they feel, we enter into a deep spatial tradition and optimism. Considered in this way, the city becomes a memory field where culture is layered as ways of life, like garments over a fundamental and ancient remembering body. This body, its atmosphere and memory, in, is an inescapable spatial reality. It is called many things, but the first people describe it best as country, as Miladina. Cultural heritage finds its beginnings in 19th century architectural theory. In the Seven Lamps of Architecture, in the chapter entitled The Lamp of Memory by John Ruskin, published in the middle of the 19th century, he wrote, For indeed the greatest glory of a building is not in its stones nor in its gold. Its glory is in its age and in that deep sense of voicefulness, of stern watching, of mysterious sympathy, which we feel in walls that have long been washed by the passing waves of humanity. In our reworking of a small Midlands cottage, we engage the particular spatial traditions of what we term the Vandemonian Georgian. Repairing two windows as contemporary insertions and reworking the promise of the interior toward the garden and the light. We were concerned here with questions of life, of that mysterious sympathy with the interior atmosphere of this small Georgian cottage. This house is now nationally and internationally celebrated for its unconventional approach to questions of cultural heritage. But it is both lauded and decried, and uh, disappointingly, in some cultural heritage spheres, it's even been called sad. And yet we see this time and again realised in the city, a completely unsatisfactory cultural heritage outcome and we inch closer to an event horizon of entirely confected landscapes and streetscapes of hollow facades left standing without their defining spatial logic intact. As spatial practitioners, we contend with these three words in the city's planning scheme. These terms are used to define the approach to heritage fabric, but also tell us many things about what is not considered important like the potential for cultural production in this age, which speaks through, a, a, through the curtain to earlier times and which engages that quality of mysterious sympathy that Ruskin extols us toward. These terms support anonymity and homogeneity. These terms are also problematic in generating subjective readings of the spatial reality and offer no experiential possibility and I don't even understand what they mean. One minute. Imagine instead turning to principles as this effort in urban thinking is promising to do, which are spatially optimistic. In international arenas, questions of preservation and adaptation are openly exercised. In their book, Preservation is Overtaking Us, Jorge Otero Palos and Rem Koolhaas point out that Preservation has become so pervasive that the effort has become to preserve the future. We are confused, they claim, if heritage is in front of us or behind us, and our confusion is jeopardising our sense of history. So we turn all of this to our thinking as a small part of the fabric of this city, an original coffin factory, where we have sleeved a series of small interiors and other buildings within the outer enclosures offered by the site. We have not broken the visual field of the fabric and have made the work 
so quiet that it is secreted into the interior of the existing forms. Uh, whatever you like. <laughs> the only expression is a series of veils recalling morning veils, which were popularised in the Victorian period. And these offer a sense of fine layering, like garments, over an inner life. And deep in the interior, gardens are secreted into surprising contexts in the interstitial spaces, marking the age. These gardens and this occupation of the fabric of the city is symbolic of our shared civic reality, of mysterious cultural sympathies and a way of life. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is Larry, um, and I haven't met Larry before today, um, but he's come here from Melbourne and he knows a thing or two about capital and also cities. Um, and I just wanted to say that, um, you know, Melbourne is a, you know, you can always learn from a city, but it's obviously a much larger city. We did some calculations. I think Melbourne's about 10 times bigger than Hobart. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind, just the scale of cities. Um, but thank you. Yeah, I apologise for being very Melbourne-centric. That's just what I know. Um, maybe there's some interesting features coming out of it. Uh, so capital, capital obviously, it has lots of advantages in terms of investment, but it also has uh, expectations and risks. Uh, it's very easy to get distracted and to forget that our main task as urban designers is to actually make the city livable day to day for normal people and it'll work for everyone. So my presentation is divided into four slots. The first one is the risks basically of scale, of bigger is better. First of all, big spaces. There's the risk that uh, you look for big spaces like Docklands, which you've already seen on the left. Uh, whereas people are really looking for more intimate spaces with defined edges, active edges, trees, shade, seating, uh, which is another space in Melbourne by the water and South Bank. Uh, buildings. Melbourne has lots of very big buildings. This has come from investment, over-investment. Um, and it got to the point, as you can see, where they were cheek by jowl, less than 10 metres apart. So Melbourne had to, in 2016, change the, the rules a bit to try and take that on. So I'm glad that you're looking at this sort of thing now, ahead of possible major development. A big project. Um, also, capital means that you uh, focus quick, quite quickly on big projects. Um, this, obviously, is Docklands again, where they put in the stadium as being one of the early works and the centrepiece for attracting other things. But basically, the design is poor, it's very inward looking, uh, and obviously it's not used every day. So they, what they created was a black hole in the middle of Docklands. They are right now, they're right now um, reworking this to open it up, um, to create new entrances, new uses around the edge to attract people. So with good design, things you know, can be made to integrate. Character. There's too much emphasis um, in trying to stand out in the crowd. That's architects, it's developers, businesses, and even, even the government. Uh, buildings, they look to be landmarks. We don't need a lot of landmarks. The one on the uh, left is just 10 years old, and people are already tired of seeing that bloody design. The one on the right is 60 years old, and it still stands the test of time. You wouldn't even know how to be able to put a date on it. Uh, it's, what we need is more background buildings. Um, local character, people try very hard to fit in, particularly heritage. There's been some terrible things in Melbourne as elsewhere. Um, the one on the right is a reasonable example where they've actually preserved a, a large part of those buildings. But really the main thing which gives character to a city and ties it together is the public realm. Now this is not Melbourne, this is a city about the size of Hobart, it's about 200,000 in the metropolitan area, it's a little smaller. Uh, Pontevedra in Spain, which has received masses of awards because over the last 
decade or more, they have been uh, working on the character of the city, uh, pedestrianising large areas. Obviously, they have a lovely historic core on the right, which is easy to do things with, but they also have some very ordinary streets with very ordinary buildings, and they've done a, a really good job to maintain vehicle access, but to, to make them people friendly. Control. When you've got a capital, you've got to make sure everything's planned to perfection. One of the biggest sort of attitudes and things that happens is the formation of precincts. It's easy to divide things into precincts to control. And so you have, you have uh, government districts, commercial districts, uh, arts precincts. This is the arts precinct in Melbourne, where they're putting all the museums together, all the art galleries together, and closing the road in between them, which is a very beautiful design, but it'll probably be quite dead um, out of hours. Uh, control, it's a decision between mandatory and discretionary. My long experience is that discretionary quite quickly gets lost when there's a lot of money involved in capital. So you really have to choose the things that are important to you, like here, and make them mandatory. Here is the street wall and the setbacks. And the rest is done by flop ratios in Melbourne. Um, and then with doing controls, you have to be very careful, very careful with testing about the unforeseen consequences. Melbourne has a very famous street wall guidance of 80% of active frontage. It leads to what you see on the right, masses of long glass walls. What we really want is what you see on the left, which is it's less than 80%, and it works perfectly. Value, my last topic. People think that there's a lot of money to be made, with all this development. This was Melbourne in 2016. Those are the buildings which were under construction or approved. And people thought that there's lots of value to be captured. Um, even in central Melbourne, there hasn't been a lot of value capture. The government contributions plans, they've tried, but because there's so many existing users, you've got to apportion a lot of the cost to them, and so you discount the, the rates and it's very complex. What they have used is floor area ratios and, and bonus uplifts and re getting things in return. But they have to be related to the site because of the Planning Environment Act in Victoria. And uh, thirdly, people have played with giving a bit extra height for things. And what that has done is put into question why the height was chosen in the first place, if you can vary it. Uh, there's other ways of getting benefit. As you, some of you probably know, Melbourne has got kilometres of blue stone paving out of developers around the sites over the decades. Um, open space contributions, they work, and they're easy to justify. 8% in the centre, 5% elsewhere. Um, and also, they're now playing with inclusionary zoning, where they oblige developers to do a certain proportion, for instance, of affordable housing. And finally, um, value, yes, but the market is very fickle and changes and you can get left with some big problems, and COVID has given us one of those where there's a lot of vacant offices. This is vacant offices in yellow in Melbourne, so they're now returning to what they were doing back in the 1990s of trying to foster more housing in the centre. Uh, with a new, they then had what they called postcode 3000, and now they're looking at that again to try and fill some of these offices. I mean, Hobart has very little housing in the centre, and that's something which gives a lot of activity. It's been very important in Melbourne. So that's it for me. I'm sorry for doing this now. Thank you, Larry. That's fascinating. Can you tell me, is it true, is there a relationship between flight paths and flight limits in Melbourne? There is, but it is like 250 metres yeah. high. <laughs> it's not. Yes. Yeah. And it's Essendon Airport, not Armory. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, that, that's completely different, obviously, to the Hobart context where we've got the central Hobart plan which sets the height limits, um, and there's plenty of people in the room who've been involved with that. So, just to put everybody at ease in regard to that. Um, um, so, yeah, in, in relation to our next speaker, we've got um, Mary, sorry, Brady, Brady <laughs> Fraser, um, who's speaking to us about being a connecting city. Um, and Mary's um, an engineer, and she's going to tell us all about it. Thank you. Well, the poetry of an engineer following all those urbanists. But anyway, um, and I'm not Mary Haviland either. I would love to marry you all. But. Other things I'm not. I'm not Stephen Burgess. 
I am shorter, I am rounder, and I have long, luscious hair. Um, Stephen, unfortunately, could not be here tonight, so he asked me to stand in, as we've got three things in common. We're transport planners, we love people in cities, and we love this city. So I would like to say that many of these slides are Steve's tonight, and I've just added my own seasoning to them. Okay, connection. Connection in our cities often happens in our public spaces. It's where we meet each other, it's where we greet, it's where we just hang out. And when we think of public spaces, we often think of the green of St David's Park, we think of our blue harbours. But actually, two-thirds of open public space are roads and streets. So it's the grey ash belt of the carriageway, it's the curbside, and it's our footpath that make up much of our public space. And in fact, in the core of Australian cities, 25% of all the land space is your roads and streets. And that's double what you've got out in the suburbs, where it's about 12%. Why do we have all this space in the city? It's because we've got connection. So roads and streets have two functions. Yes, they're there for a transport network. Yes, they're there to enable our journeys. But they're also really important public spaces, particularly in our cities. And roads and streets, these two functions, change in different sections of our network. They change by block on the same corridor. The bottom of Macquarie Street outside Franklin Square is a really important place in the city where we just hang out, cross the street, wait for a bus, or if you're my children, spend all my money on bubble tea and meeting your next girlfriend. It also changes by time of day. Salamanca Place on a Saturday morning has a very different role and function to that of a Thursday afternoon or a Friday or Saturday night, which is where they'll probably meet their girlfriends when they're older. And finally, also time of year. So Davy Street, one of the key movement corridors for the city, is a place that we shut down and turn into a place for something like Dark Mofo and for the parade. So our roads and streets have to enable both movement and place at different scales and, in different, um, and at different proportions at different times of the year, different times of the week, and in different places. So a good urban framework will include movement and place principles for its roads and streets to enable connection in the city. Roads and streets enable us to move through a place, they enable us to go to a place, but they also enable us to be in a place, and that's my handsome little boys. So how's Hobart doing as a connected city? How are we doing at each of those roles? Well, anyone who's tried to move through Hobart you know, at 6 a.m. on a Wednesday morning on the way to the airport, has punched the air in delight as they've hit the green light at the top of Davie Street and flown and hit every green light the whole way down. This experience is not shared in the peak hour. This experience is not shared if you don't own a car. Getting through our city can be really difficult. And there's a reason for that. Private cars are not a very good design solution for moving lots of people at the same time to the same place. In fact, private cars detract from our roads and streets. They make them congested, polluted, and less good for placemaking. So what is a good solution? Public transport is really good for public access. The clue is in the name. So more ferries, more buses, more transit solutions are a great way of getting through our city, but also enabling large amounts of people to access our city without turning it into something like this. What about local access and moving around the city? Well, active travel activates places. The clue is in the name. Transport planners aren't very smart. And why is this? Because active travel is about people, and it's people who spend money. It's people who make you feel less lonely. It's people who hang out with you. It's people who connect in a city, not cars. And finally, who are these people that we want? Well, anyone who's heard Steve speak knows that he's all about having young people in the city. This isn't a creepy thing. I've sat down and worked it out and chatted to him about it. It's because young people often don't drive, they use public transport, they use active tra travel, and they spend lots of time in the city. And if they're like my children, they buy lots of bubble tea. 
So young people are a really important part of connection in the city and young people love great roads and streets. They love the unexpected to happen and the frisson that goes with it. So finally, connected cities. We know the recipe. We know it's about getting people to stick, stop, stay and spend in our city. We've got excuses of why this isn't happening, but these are excuses, not reasons. We know the recipe, we know what will work. We know that private cars can detract from places. We know that public transport is great for public access. We know active travel activates places, activates, and we also know that people, people are the key to connection and connection in our city. So to create a great connected city in Hobart, Let's make our roads and streets living rooms. Let's make them less of those hallways and movement corridors. Let's make, them, let's make the city less of a garage. Let's use good transport planning principles with urban design to create a connected city. Judith, do you like to be called Judith in public? Oh, yeah, mostly, doesn't that? Yeah. <laughs> so Jude, Jude um, clearly a friend of mine, but Jude's an artist, so this should be really fun. Um, and, you know, I just think it plays such an incredibly important part of the city for everybody, not just for the little people. So hopefully you can tell us about play a little, yeah? Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, mate. Um, and I was just going to say that... Um, I'm speaking about a creative city um, that I've decided and also as a bit of a palate cleanser for what I knew would be a lot of complicated information to just talk about my tiny piece, which is just about public art, which is my expertise at the moment. Hopefully this works. Oh, there we go. Since 1962, on the hour every hour, this clock has brought 30 seconds of public delight to the centre of Hobart, and each day a small crowd gathers when I posted this video to Instagram recently, a friend spotted her 18-year-old daughter here waiting and watching. Her daughter said, Oh, well, we were walking through and realised it was one minute two and I wanted to relive my childhood. And so did my friends. We often speak of the creative aspect of a city as a nice to have or an added extra. But what if it were essential? If you believe the hype, Hobart prides itself on being a creative city, advertises itself as such. In a creative city, there must be room for delight. I love how everyone just turns and goes at the end. <laughs> In August 2022, these stickers started appearing throughout the city. Should you follow the QR code, you would experience ambiguous and atmospheric videos you might be left none the wiser, but you would be filled with a sense of expectation. Just a dancer. And then maybe you're going about your day and an entourage of seemingly famous people walk by. People stop and stare. Maybe he stops and takes a selfie with you. Maybe you saw Van Ramsey last year. His face is everywhere, but why haven't you heard of him? This is Matt Stop, a local performer and comedian who has created the character of an ageing, glam rock star called Van Ramsey. <laughs> he brings an unexpected insertion of glamour and humour to an ordinary day. This is delight. Maybe one day you park your car and head to the lifts, and while you wait for the lift to get to your floor, you discover that local boy Luca Redwig, great name, has broken a world record for crab walking. <laughs> True story. Ha! I'm delighted, are you? Maybe you are riding to work along the river with your child on your back, on the back, and you discover that you've entered the solar system. You count off these cheeky, smiling planets with your kid and marvel at just how far it is between the sun and Neptune. That's delight. Maybe you clock a new plaque on the wall. Hang on a second. 2028? What's the event? What is the city of New Hobart? Your mind reels to another time as yet unseen by anyone. Is it better than now? Have we solved some of our crises? That's delight. 
Maybe you look up as you walk for coffee and you see these sorry, that's loud. Beaded portals gently moving in the breeze. Why are they there? You keep looking up as you go about the rest of your day, even into the night, just in case. Maybe you see this. That's delight. Your sister, child, cousin, workmate, workplace is involved in painting a small piece of the city that spikes the usual pedestrian or car commute with colour, pattern, amplified nature or comic relief. You mentally collect these images in your mind's eye and proudly tell others of this participation. This is delight. Your poem is immortalised within the public art of a newly refurbished Lena Valley. It tells the story of your relationship with a feisty japonica from childhood to now, and in doing so reflects a long-standing relationship with place. This is delight. One minute. Excellent. <laughs> or maybe you walk through a lane you've walked through for years, and your ears are retuned by unexpected sounds that creep in. Where are they coming from? This space feels different, perhaps even filmic. Is time slower, maybe a little stickier here, just for a moment? There is arguably no other urban input that can create these kind of mental shifts in the experience of those that dwell in urban space. And what a difference it is to arrive in the city each day with a sense of expectation. What might I see, hear, move through, or engage with that might transform my experience here from one of pure function to one of delight. and in Hobart too now, is that right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's really important, I think, I just kind of, it's sort of self-evident, but obviously, so Helen is instructing the students and then the students are making the drawings and then they are making the world. So, um, you know, the things that the universities are emphasising are really, takes a long time, but that, you know, takes a long time to make a city. So I've asked Helen to talk about caring, which is, you know, quite a difficult and intangible thing in some ways, but it's really, critically important for the city. So thank you, Helen. Thanks, Meg. Um, the Caring City is something that's been developed as a global, uh, kind of globally, but also when Matt was talking about things being embodied, I think it's actually something that is quite deeply embodied in um, Hobart um, at the moment. So the definitions that are held globally are about being accessible, affordable, embracing difference, diverse spaces for diverse people and open to change. Um, and this is sort of really one of the things that is probably an uncaring city, I love this image, that the thing about human nature is it's so resilient that actually um, the caring and engagement with each other will happen even if we don't plan it because people are kind of tougher than cities. But I think what becomes really important is that that's not um, the extent of caring, the only place you can inhabit is the space between two bumper bars. Um, one of the things that's important to remember about Hobart, which is we all know, but um, you can kind of, uh, it's important to reinforce when you're thinking about urban design principles, is that we're a small population in a big landscape. So um, the island of Tasmania is equivalent in size to the island of Ireland. Um, and that also Greater Hobart has the same um, footprint as Manhattan Island, and yet there's, um, to 1,600 people there and there's actually only 200,000 here. So we've got a very few number of people occupying a really big piece of landscape. And so with that, that actually um, pre um, presents a whole lot of complexities in relation to caring. And some of those uncaring complexities are things like the fact that in the 1960s there was an idea to try and keep the city small so the small population was within a small area, which would mean the landscape kept reading as large but you can see the red bits of where the city is actually extended to. And 
in an un, uh, one of the really interesting pieces of research that's come out of Griffith University is this Viper and Vampire Studies, and I love how both of the acronyms sound evil, and so they must be evil. So they're about the vulnerability assessment for mortgage, <laughs> petrol and inflation, and the vulnerability index for petroleum. But effectively what that drawing of Melbourne shows, you could do a very equivalent one in Hobart, which is that the cheaper land and the places for people of lower socioeconomic um, levels are actually on the edges of cities and they are the ones that are actually full of the greatest disadvantage. So continuing to build the cities in the way that we're building is not a very caring um, sort of approach for the future and that's something that should be addressed. You can argue that there's um, potentially five catalysts for change and that the um, mechanisms that we can actually use to embrace the caring city are really the way we think about the public space the public edge, the line between the building that you own and the space that the city occupies, the different functions and how they're dispersed within individual buildings and across the city, um, the way we think about culture in different ways and our approach to transport. Um, I think caring cities, we have a lot of these in Hobart, but it's really important that as we continue to develop, we don't lose the balance between the recreational spaces and the, the capital that Larry talks about that actually comes in. And Jan Gell, who did the work here in, I think, 20, uh, 2012, um, the public space, public life, suggests that not only do we need public spaces, but he actually suggests that we need this topology of about 12 different types of public spaces. And if you overlay those different spatial topologies, you realise that it's not good enough to just have one Salamanca or one St David's Square, but there's public spaces of all different scales that we can actually wind together and that becomes a really important part of making a caring city. The other thing is thinking about the city as an urban playground, not just for kids and not about putting swing sets in, but the way that the city becomes an armature for active play, for social play and imaginative play. Um, and I guess we're super lucky about that because um, as adults we actually have that happen a um, couple of times a year with Mona who really show us how to live the use the city in that way. And I think that the temporary infrastructure that Mona has actually put in has um, led the way constantly for us to rethink some of our development. Um, the informal cultural infrastructure becomes really important as well, boardwalks that are designed in a way that can expand out and hold fairs. And um, the other thing is just making spaces that allow us to adapt to people's needs. Um, so I think that's my last slide and some, just some general thoughts about um, the future of the city. Oh no, hang on, there's a couple more. Agriculture then is part of urban space. So the whole idea that you don't necessarily have to have farms and houses being separate, but the way that things can be intertwined with each other. And we certainly found that the supply chain issues that happened during COVID makes us really think we need to rethink things. The way that we design our streets can actually become a really important interface that you can still have uh, the couplet that runs through the city, but the way that that can actually be organised can be done differently. And this is Peter Poulet's work when we had a very short-lived um, state government architect. Within that is a really important part of multimodal transport and we're seeing that already with the ferries and how much that's actually been taken up and embraced and for all of us who have e-bikes, there's such a game changer and what we need now is more infrastructure that makes riding e-bikes um, sa as safe as it is fun. And finally, I think that everything that we do needs to continue to connect us to the broader landscape so that we're reminded that the landscape is something that we need to care for and is a really important part part of our sense of caring for each other. Thanks. Righty, two to go. Um, so um, our next speaker is Dave, who's a colleague of mine at the City of Hobart. Um, and Dave's going to speak to the idea of circular and um, you know, we have all these principles and they're all interconnected so they're not supposed to be, you know, um, entirely separate but, um, you know, this is a really fascinating topic and it connects in with the climate strategy that's being developed at the moment at the City of Hobart. Um, and Dave has had a really interesting experience. He's um, been involved with Indigenous communities and working also in Nepal. Um, What's your other thing? Um, sorry. Um, anyway, yeah, so Dave's really fascinating. <laughs> things from worn out from all the talking. Um, yeah, Dave's going to talk to us about um, 
synthetic design? So what was your uh, systemic systemic design? That's what I'm trying to think about. I think it's best if you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the what's the system that we're going with here? Are we controlling our own slides? Yeah. Cool. Can you hear me? Okay. Great. So. Yes, um, Megan asked me to try and do the talk only in alliteration of the letter C, and I've, I've chosen not to go with that. <laughs> it's quite challenging. Um, but good to be here with you tonight. And I'm just going to start off by uh, sharing this image I drew about uh, 10 or more years ago when I was first studying sustainability. Um, and it, I tend to draw as a way of making sense of you know, what I'm hearing. And this, was, this has kind of served as a refrain for me, as a bit of a reminder to come back to about the sort of fundamental interconnectedness of us and living systems. And um, yeah, it, I'm not suggesting we build this kind of um, organic death star, but it's, um, you know, it's more of a metaphor that, that I really um, enjoy sort of thinking about how do we live well within natural systems. Um, this is an image that was taken by Craig Garth up the back there from uh, being a drone pilot. And I really love this image because at this time of night, as the sun's going down um, and from this vantage point, see Hobart as this really living, breathing system. Um, and for me, that just kind of reinforces this sense of, you know, um, care. We, we, need to, we need to look after this place and we have a responsibility as people who live, work and play here to do that well. Um, those of us who have been working in sustainability for years have been sort of heading towards this kind of holy grail of sustainability as, as a concept of, you know, doing less harm, um, circular systems, closing loops, less waste. Um, we, we're sort of starting to find that the language of sustainability is no longer serving uh, us in terms of the, the goals that we're trying to achieve. And we're actually starting to see that we need to go beyond just doing less harm and, um, and create systems that restore and regenerate nature and the natural systems that we're embedded within. There's heaps of great examples of this happening in action all across the city, and I'm less going to talk about buildings um, for this talk and more about the things that we might want to be doing more of in the city. So how do we make space for what matters and how might urban design guidelines support that? Um, Fogo is a great little example across the city of how we're starting to divert tons and tons of waste, thousands of it from uh, landfill, and how that can start to generate electricity for us as well. Um, I go to the Hobart Aquatic Centre a lot. It's a, it's a great community place. There's a cool example of, um, of heating um, in a circular system here where um, some of a good portion of the heating is drawn from uh, treated sewerage that generates heat and then is uh, exchanged into clean water and captured as a sort of a giant battery that gets used, a water battery that gets used in sort of high, um, high usage periods. Um, how do we create more of these things? How do we use examples like this and amplify them? Um, there's some entrepreneurial folks doing great things across the city uh, in terms of getting more EVs on the road. The Good Car Company uh, have been working with community groups to do bulk purchases of EVs um, and getting, yeah, getting more of these on the roads quicker. And so we as a city are going to need to sort of catch up in terms of the infrastructure and, and make sure that we're ready and equipped to handle this transition. Uh, there's some amazing places, natural places, unique places around the city that um, you know have thrived despite some of the compromises that um, you know have occurred due to human uh, interaction and us just being here and living the way that we've been living. Um, you know, it doesn't take much to animate the imagination and reconnect us with the specialness of these places. And we've seen more recently how you know a single platypus and its story and, and a man's connection to that has really ignited the public imagination about how we can start to restore this and, and there's people doing great work to restore the rivulet at the moment. One minute. Okay. Um, this is an example of uh, you know, a repair reuse cafe. Um, this is um, that we could create more spaces for, people learning together. Um, this is a place where, uh, this is in Melbourne actually, this is one of the few buildings in Australia that's received the uh, Living Building Challenge Award from the Living, uh, Institute, Living Futures Institute, and they've got some great resources on how we can really go to the next level to guide the kind of buildings and places that we're designing. Um, I don't need to talk about this, because Alaric 
already talked about this slide, but this is a different uh, image of it, so and maybe we can triangulate, but you know, what does it look like when we actually don't hide our waste systems and put them outside of the city and actually say, well, this is a, uh, an opportunity for us to learn together and embrace this um, as a sort of a, you know, a core part of the city and what we do um, and you know, bring it into our vision and bring it into our view. Um, Melbourne are doing really great things in terms of measuring what matters. Um, they've worked across the community. You know, this is a self-organising um, movement that's come together to say, well, we need uh, to agree upon what are the measures that really mean that we can protect the social needs of people as well as not uh, overshooting the ecological boundaries. It's worth checking out. They've got some great measurement tools online. Um, this is an image created by Lily May from Utah's Design School who worked with us around a, a challenge that we did about movement in place. And what I love is that there's this sort of idea of circularity, not just in terms of resources and energy, but um, in terms of stories and, and meaning, past and future. So I like the invitation here to think uh, in sort of longer terms about time and how do we bring knowledge and meaning across time. Um, no design talks would be complete without a few AI-generated images, and there's a couple that I cooked up uh, a couple of hours ago, earlier today. Um, and yeah, just playing with some of the ideas earlier about what's already kind of working well in the city, you know, what might it look like to create more space for, for what matters and, and um, you know, become more gen regenerative, more circular in our economies, in our ways of using waste, in our ways of uh, relating to and creating energy. Um, and, uh, you know, this is just my idea uh, and my description, but I invite everyone to, to, to kind of play with these tools because they're, they're democratising. You don't need to be a designer to generate imagery uh, to join the conversation now. Uh, here's another one. I, I tried quite hard to describe what a platypus looked like through AI, and it, it, didn't, it didn't really get it. So. <laughs> that, that's how unique a platypus is. Um, that aside, and I think at, at the back there, there's a platypus with, with no heads and two tails. But um, this is a place I'd like to spend time in. This is a kind of a, a rivulet that really integrates, um, you know, biophilic design and, and takes principles from nature and, and integrates the two beautifully. Um, quick shout out to some of the work we're doing. Um, this is Climate Ready Hobart. This is a, a conversation we've started with the community working towards the next uh, s uh, strategy, a sustainability strategy or climate strategy. Um, and um, now is the current period where we're doing a lot of uh, collaboration across different groups, community leaders, climate leaders, experts, building evidence and insight about the solutions that are gonna work and they're informing the next strategy. So I invite you all to join the conversation, jump online, either have your say online or apply to join the Hobart Climate Assembly, which is a citizens assembly that's happening in, um, in both uh, February and March and um, is a, a great experiment in uh, yeah, community-led decision-making and um, you know, how do we live well together within the natural systems that we're living, this is all part of it. So thank you very much. engagement process, um, do let the city know what you would like to see. Um, Hobart's been a leader in this space for all the last 20 years and it's, you know, it's really exciting. So please. Um, our last speaker tonight is Lee Woolley, who um, again for the last 20 plus years has been talking about the nature of this city. Um, and I don't think I'm going to sum that up, but Lee, um, thinks about these things very deeply and will um, tell us his thoughts very beautifully, I'm sure. So thank you, Lee. together, um, which is no doubt the urban design reference, but also that contrast with the other meaning of compact, which is the agreement or contract between entities or parties. 
And I'd like to use both these constructs of com being compact um, in reference to the atmosphere of the city that we share. And of course, the spatial experience of, of Greater Hobart and the municipality of Hobart is simultaneously regional and local, defined by the containment by rising and high ground in contrast to the release across water plains and water bodies. However, for a long time, the setting was simply being treated as land awaiting development, rather than considering the layered margins within this spatial continuum. And all else suffers, I suggest, without the intent that defines our desire to be compact. But indeed, oops, where does that come from? And it's of course, it's embedded in the landform structure of the region and indeed the central area of Hobart. However, we need to plan and design according to these geomorphological foundations, recognising that this is how we orient ourselves. And fortunately, this uh, approach has found its way into important documents, including the planning scheme of the city of Hobart. However, compact is inherent to James Meehan's plan for the town from 1811. Indeed, there was a compact with the terrain that generated its dual alignments. The first one, along the Macquarie Ridge, became his baseline. The second, the important one adjacent to the shore, but above the escarpment and parallel with the shore, was the other alignment. And it's from both these alignments that the layout of the streets applied, creating the non-orthogonal plan that we now have for our civic centre. And when that compact sense of a plan is, or, and its deformed grid and its differentiated character is overlain within the city landform, the central city landform, it provides the familiar civic core. But compact is also recognising the non-orthogonal streets Elizabeth, Murray, and Liverpool. And these reinforce the diverse proportions of each urban block and the shape of the city centre that emerged. One minute, or a fair bit more than one minute. <laughs> <laughs> but compact is not just the ground of the town plan, but it's also defined by the urban amphitheatre and the landform horizons that we share. These are now terms in the planning scheme. And it's these connections from our civic core, northwest, southeast, southwest, and northeast, that take compact into the extended setting of, the, of Greater Hobart. However, the Hobart dwelling region is not compact. Not because the spatial and geographic limits to its bounds are not there, but because the intent to be defined by those limits has not been pursued. In reality, we are one of the least, uh, one of the lowest density urban settlements in the nation, with the highest proportion of single detached dwellings. We know at heart this is unsustainable. And in order to build long-term resilience, our ecological footprint needs to be reduced. Compact means we not only need urban growth boundaries, but growth being considered part of a sustainable bioregion. 
compact is also recognising that our settlement and built history has useful precedents, especially regarding the density. The density of 19th century Battery Point provides some of the densest housing and most sought after in the state. And while talking about Battery Point, it's, um, it's important to remember that urban design initiatives and their implementation takes time. A case in point is some work I did only 40 years ago for the then River Derwent Management Plan for the idea of a Battery Point foreshore walk. 40 years and counting, but it's on the, it's on the table again, which is great. Time is really important where urban design principles and frameworks are concerned. But the combination, but compact, is the combination of urban design moves to sustain intensity, such as the interplay of building amenity envelopes applied to each street, together with view cones connecting to the landform horizons, to then generate a potential envelope for each urban block, combining as a denser centre where locational amenity is retained. It's been proven. But if we know what it means to be compact, we receive that from the shared landforms and water plains of our dwelling region and the place it confirms to us. Compact then is an outcome in response to our place, offering a sheltering domain within a larger landscape cradling a small city at the southern edge of the urbanised world. And the diagram is also within the planning scheme, which is the big change in the last 40 years. 